So today I'm looking at five observations that I learned after watching the Packers and the Vikings in week one. So the first thing, and I'm going to quit beating this dead horse um, now that it seems to be a little bit more concrete, but there was clearly a debate about the Vikings defense. Um, I think we've pretty well established that the Vikings defense needs some help. Even when you get Daniil Hunter back, the fact of the matter is the defensive line is not all that great. Daniil Hunter is a really good pass rusher. The defensive tackles are eh, and Yannick Ngakwe is not as good as you all thought he was. There's a reason he was sat on the market for as long as he did. There's a reason he took a major pay cut. It's because he had a really good year in like 2016 and since then has not done all that much. He's good, not great. The corners are a very serious problem. Now, Jeff Gladney seemed to have a decent enough time. I don't know why he didn't get much time out there. I guess he just, you know, he needs to get caught up to speed or whatever. But um, there's some potential with the younger guys. But as of right now, this is a problem. And the, and the biggest problem is you've got no Hunter for three weeks. There's no reason to believe the, the cornerbacks are going to get up to speed in the next three weeks. Um, everybody kind of played poorly. If you look at PFF, I got their grades. Nobody graded out well. I think Gladney was the highest graded guy. Your elite safeties did not do well. Even Kendricks did not grade out all that well, despite having some really good plays. Apparently, other situations, he must have been doing pretty poorly. Um, the real risk here is obviously the NFL season is 16 games. You're 0-1. There's a real risk of going 0-3 if, if this defense doesn't get fixed. Um, and then beyond that, obviously, there's there's tougher games down the schedule that even at full strength are going to be tough to win, um, including, you know, again, the Green Bay Packers. And, and I don't really know what else you've got. I know the Packers have the Saints. Maybe if you guys have them queued up. I don't know if we're playing the NFC South. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Point is, there's tough games coming up. And um, this defense has to get figured out quickly. Now, fortunately, you have Zimmer. He's a pretty smart guy. But um, the Packers obviously are n not inexploitable especially for a guy that's that's really good at coming up with creative blitzes and whatnot when you have an offensive line that was as decimated not only do we lose brian balaga but our our then right tackle was supposed to be billy turner he was hurt so then we put elton jenkins at right tackle he's so our number three tackle essentially from last year's standpoint anyways um was in and you guys couldn't do anything against him then we lose a guard so we have to kick elton back into guard so our number four tackle comes out you couldn't do anything against him that's rick wagner which Granted, that's a little unfair because Rick Wagner's been a long-time tackle. But bottom line is we had that. We had like a number three, our, our third guard coming in, Runyon, who was a uh, rookie sixth-round pick. That came in and allowed zero pressures, zero hits, sacks, or hurries. Um, he's never even run with the ones even once in training camp. So, you know, the fact is there was, there was plenty of potential. The bar is a very good pass rusher as a linebacker. Kendricks is a good pass rusher. You do have Hunter, who maybe isn't quite, or excuse me, you have Yannick, who maybe isn't elite, but he's still talented. There's no reason why you shouldn't have been able to get to Aaron Rodgers at least a couple times. As banged up as this Packers offensive line is, that should have been the case. Um, and so, again, the, the point is there's a potential here if things break right for the Vikings to for them to self-correct, but you don't have a lot of time. Again, in a, if this was baseball and we had 600,000 games to play, no big deal. But um, something has to get figured out in the next three weeks that doesn't include Daniil Hunter and probably doesn't include these these cornerbacks suddenly just figuring it out. And um, that's going to be problematic, but, you know, best of luck. Next up, obviously, Aaron Rodgers still has something left in the tank. Um, there's a lot of talk. Well, the Vikings corners were bad. Okay, via PFF, this was his best game since 2010. This is the, he was the highest graded quarterback in all of football in week one. His grade was a 96 overall. Pat Mahomes has never in his career gotten a grade of 96 to give you an idea of how high of a grade that is. To say that that's simply because the, uh, the Vikings corners were that bad is silly. It's a lame excuse from people who don't want to give Aaron Rodgers credit. It's nonsense. Mitch Trubisky couldn't get a 96 overall grade if there were no corners on the field. I know because I watched part of that game and I saw balls go flying where there's no receivers. Guess what? No 96 for you. You threw a ball over there. Your receiver's over there. You suck. You lose. So that's not the case. Now, how this continues on, I don't really know. Clearly, he's not going to be able to. He probably will never get a 96 for the rest of his career. Again, this is the second highest grade he's ever gotten in his entire life. Um, and the, the first of this decade. So 
very, very rare and, and unlikely that we see another one like this for the rest of the year. But what does it mean going forward? Because the fact of the matter is, a guy that's kind of washed up and doesn't have it anymore does not put together a game like that. We saw Tom Brady and Drew Brees and the struggles they're having. You, you look at a lot of other older quarterbacks who are hanging on for dear life. This is not a quarterback that's hanging on for dear life. This is somebody who clearly still, as I said, has something left in the tank. So again, that, that doesn't necessarily mean this is 2011 Aaron Rodgers all over again, but the excuse that Aaron Rodgers doesn't have it left in the tank is dead. It's dead, it's dying, it's over. And unless the Minnesota Vikings defense is the worst defense of all time, which I'm willing to concede that if you want to take up that mantle, if you want to say that, then okay, fine, we'll wait and see what happens in week two. And again, I don't expect this to happen again with Aaron Rodgers doing this well. But um, again, it's, it's, it's very clear to me, whether it's because he's doing squats, like he said, or because uh, Danica's gone, which is the what, what I'm rolling with, um, for whatever reason, he's been rejuvenated. And so uh, Green Bay Packers fans rejoice because Aaron Rodgers is back. Numero three on the list, the Green Bay Packers do have wide receivers. And I've never really understood this, um, this line. Again, you go down the list, there's a lot of teams that have worse wide receiver groups than the Green Bay Packers, even when we thought that they had garbage wide receivers. Drew Brees has one really good wide receiver and what? Uh, Pat Mahomes has one good wide receiver and also a tight end. But the, just down the line, right? Deshaun Watson, he has one good wide receiver and nobody. But nobody talks about that. It's all just about Aaron Rodgers and he doesn't get any help and blah, blah, blah. It's so stupid. I mean, it's just, I think it's just people trying to make excuses for Aaron Rodgers for when things don't go well. You know, why don't you get him another wide receiver? Why don't you, you haven't done, it doesn't matter if you haven't done it. And as I also looked at on the podcast, um, if you actually compare Alan Lazard and how he graded out and everything else compared to other teams' number twos, Alan Lazard is fine. He's he's right up there. He's, he's better than average in terms of number two wide receivers and how that all shakes out. So I never really bought that, but the fact of the matter is it's been pretty well concreted. Um, again, it's week one, but the fact of the matter is you've got two guys that are very different in their skill sets, and the thing that I like is that they're playing to their strengths. When you saw Alan Lazard win... It was number one Aaron Rodgers with a great throw, but he's also utilizing them properly. Alan Lazard wasn't getting a lot of separation, but he's a big body guy, and a lot of these passes were just in the right spot, and he just uses his frame to box out the defender, uses big bear paws to come down with that ball, and it just worked, right? It was Alan Lazard staying within what he does. He's not Devontae Adams. He's not a perfectly well-rounded wide receiver, but he's got a specific set of skills that he utilizes to his advantage, and Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers and Alan Lazard are all understanding what that is and how to utilize it, including on jet sweeps, apparently, which I don't quite understand, but hey, whatever works. And then MVS, what is MVS? He's a really tall speed guy, right? So he's going to run really fast. Aaron Rodgers lobs it up over people. He goes up and gets it. That's it. That's what he does. He's only going to get a couple of those a game. Doesn't matter. That's what he does. He's an absolute threat. The biggest problem last year was that Aaron Rodgers couldn't really put the ball on the guy. Right, he was always overthrowing him, and whether that was MVS, maybe not quite going at the right angle, or maybe he was slowing down, or whatever it was, it just wasn't working. Clearly seems to be working. Aaron Rodgers didn't miss him once. MVS did have a couple drops. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything really to be concerned with as far as the wide receivers are concerned. Not that they're elite wide receivers, but they're plenty good enough. As long as Aaron Rodgers continues to play at a high level, and I'm not talking about elite, like I just said, 17 times. I'm just saying if he plays at a high level, a top five, top 10 quarterback level that doesn't have the high rate of inconsistent play like Aaron Rodgers has had over the last several years where he's just putting the ball in the right place at the right time, making good decisions, there's no concern with the wide receivers whatsoever. The fourth thing we learned, and I think it rolls up pretty nicely with a couple other things that we said, um, but it's that the Green Bay Packers are finally multiple. One of the biggest issues with the Packers offense for years has been their way too one-dimensional. It's Devontae Adams and nobody. And if you can take Devontae Adams away, you cripple the Packers offense. We since added Aaron Jones. Well, the interesting thing about this past game against the Vikings is they completely sold out against Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones decimated the Vikings the last time that they saw each other, the last two times they saw each other, possibly more, I don't know. Um, but they stacked the box via next-gen stats more than any other team against any other running back. Aaron Jones saw an eight-man box more than anybody in the NFL. The problem is that doesn't help you against Devontae. When you add in Swerve and Irvin, 
the running back who's running all these jet sweeps and just tearing you up that way. You run, you got Alan Lazard doing what Alan Lazard does. You got MVS doing what MVS does. You got AJ Dillon, who's a different type of back. He only saw the ball twice, but he ran at seven yards per carry, right? He's breaking every single arm tackle. So there's there's getting to the outside. There's smashing it up the middle. There's going deep. There's staying short. There's a lot of quick short passes. They've got the deep ball. We've got the speedsters on the on the sweeps and all these misdirection type stuff. We've also got tight ends. J- uh, Josiah DeGuara just got into the mix. He was a great blocker. Also had one, I think, 12-yard reception. You get him mixed in. Suddenly, you can't just key in on one thing and take the Packers away. You have to stop a lot of different things. And what's true of every offense is when you have too many weapons, there's no defense in the NFL that has that much talent that they can stop all these different things. And especially when you have a cerebral quarterback like Aaron Rodgers, maybe we can't go this way, but we can go this way. right? There's, there's always something, and it's a matter of reading the defense properly, making the right decision at the right time, and it's going to mean success for the Green Bay Packers. PFF had them at, rated as the not only the number one offense, but the number one team, thanks to how highly the offense rated. But just across the board, the offense executed really, really well. And I, I do attribute a lot of that to the fact that the Packers, for the first time in a very long time, look multiple. And that's even more so than when they were, you know, back in the day, you know, 2010, 2011, where the Green Bay Packers were a really good passing team because they had five good wide receivers. This is even more than that. They didn't have a good running back. They didn't have a really good tight end. They didn't have a whole lot of different looks. It was just our wide receivers are better and we're going to throw it to the open guy because somebody's going to be open. This is multiple in multiple different ways. This is a very 2020-esque style of top-tier offense. Again, I'll say this caveat 60,000 times. It's week one. We'll see how this plays out and how defenses can adjust to this. But the fact of the matter is it's hard to adjust. All right? a, a couple of gimmick plays are one thing, but when you have actually talented players that are able to win in multiple ways, that's a separate thing. And that's what we got to find out down the line. Is this guys that are just winning? Or is it just kind of gimmicky stuff that Matt LaFleur pulled out of his back pocket? And, um, you know, that's going to be rectified in the next couple. I, I tend to think based on how top tier, for example, the the routes that the guys are running, that's not fluky. The pinpoint passes, that's not fluky. That's not a defense. Just not You can't figure out how to stop a perfect pass. But I digress. The final point and the final thing that I believe we've learned is that Matt LaFleur is for real. Um, it's obviously a pretty big question mark coming in. It's one thing to be really cerebral and, and sort of to almost be like a professor, right? Um, to where you, you could teach the scheme to somebody and know it top to bottom. And I, I believe we know that he is a PhD in sort of the Shanahan system. He's been bathed in it for years and years and years and years and years. He's, he's got it all upstairs, extremely intelligent. But that's a separate thing from being a head coach. That's a separate thing from understanding how to you know, organize a locker room, how to, how to set up your schedule and, and how to, uh, you know, monitor snaps and all that stuff. And it's certainly a separate thing as far as, as game planning, which is massively important to coming up with a general plan to attack a team. It's different than in-game adjustments. It's different than play calling on a play to play basis. Here's the down, here's the distance, here's the situation. Boom, come up with a play right now. What are you going to do to beat this defense? What are you going to do based on what they've done? And, and the entire premise of the scheme is we do these things to set up this thing, right? We, we come at you this way, this way, this way, and then you think we're going this way and we go this way, right? It's it's all mind games type stuff. you got to be on top of your game. And again, a large part of this victory, and Aaron Rodgers even said so, was we had a really good game plan coming in. And you see the, the effect that they're multiple, which is something they haven't been in a long time. You see utilizing people in the proper way. You see guys that are talented that maybe other coaches would say, eh, I don't know, like Tyler Irvin, you know, he's, he's had a couple good plays, but we're going to kind of let him go to the side. No, you're making plays. You're a talented guy. Maybe we can only use you in these one or two ways, but that's exactly what we're going to do. And he, he finds the right pieces, puts them in the right spots at the right time for the right opportunities. He's got the game plan down. He's got all these things. He's got a long way to go. But everything that I can see, especially going 13-3 and three in your first year, um, you know, you got to wonder is that, you know, when you hear about how they're frauds and it's a fluke and all this kind of stuff, he gets no credit for his 13-win season. You come out week one, smash the Vikings. We're right back on track. Again, largely because of the massive growth of this offense that we see in year two. You see the the Packers offensive line, which has always been very good at pass blocking, but never any good at run blocking, is suddenly one of the best run blocking teams after one week. You got guys like David Bakhtiari was a top 10 run blocker. He's never been able to run block in his life. 
these kinds of things in which we're we're changing the team to a new scheme. And, and by the way, you want to get David Bakhtiari a contract, it's that he can become a Matt LaFleur style tackle. Not that you don't pay a guy like David Bakhtiari anyways, for those that don't know, that's a serious question right now. But for him to stay that good as a, as a pass blocking tackle, but also grow as a run blocker, which is massively important in Matt LaFleur's scheme, I don't know why you don't pay him at this point if he's able to do both of those things. By the way, number one pass blocking tackle, I think possibly offensive lineman this entire week. Um, all this stuff points to Matt LaFleur as the guy. Bottom line, you know, I'm not going to put him in a, a rank him. He's the top two, three, four, five. I don't really care. The point is, he's the right guy for the job. They made the right call. Super happy that we have him. That's it. That's all I got. That's my five things that I figured out. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. Make sure you hit the like, hit the little bell notification, all that good stuff. If you're a Packer fan, check out the Packernet podcast seven days a week. Much more in depth than all this stuff, but it's pretty similar in terms of observations and whatnot. Um, otherwise, have a good day, and I'll check you out tomorrow.